Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's session. My name is Doug Olenek, and I am the online editor for SC Media and your moderator for this program, which is sponsored by Cisco. The topic is Designing Security for the Future of Your Network. Joining us is Meg Diaz, a product manager with Cisco, where she heads product marketing and insights for Cisco's cloud security business. Now, before we get started, I'd like to remind everyone of one quick housekeeping item. There will be a question and answer period after the presentation, so please place your questions in the space provided on your screen. Now, cloud-based apps and the increasing use of highly distributed environments and a more mobile workforce combined with a threat landscape that just isn't standing still is not making anyone's job out there any easier. So today, Meg will give everyone some insight as to what your peers are experiencing in their work environments, along with a new approach to secure roaming users and branch locations. So now I would like to turn the show over to Meg. Great. Thank you, Doug, and thank you all for joining today. If we take a look first at IT trends, and if you think about how things used to work, it used to be a much simpler time, right? This is how things used to work with network and security. All of your applications used to be hosted on-prem. You had to be on the corporate network in order to access them and get your work done. Branch offices would be out there and would, would backhaul all traffic to the corporate data center uh, over MPLS. And all of the internet access would come through that main data center. And that's where you built up a complete security stack too. You had your firewall, your secure web gateway, everything was deployed there. And when roaming users needed to access it, they had to connect through the VPN. And for years, this has been the way that most companies have deployed their network architecture. And it allowed you to have that single place for all of your security. But if we look at what's been happening, um, networks are becoming much more decentralized. And because of the internet and the cloud, you can now connect and get work done from any device, any location, at any time. And we're seeing the network transform. So as we see more applications move to the cloud and, and change the way that we work, we're seeing networks change too. We see you know, more roaming users. Branch offices are now adopting um, more direct internet access or direct cloud access. And when you think about it, MPLS is really expensive. And in most places, broadband internet service is cheap. So a lot of organizations are starting to re-architect their network to use MPLS only for those most critical um, apps like voice and, and video. And instead, they're moving to connect directly to the internet. And as we see more organizations uh, start to refresh their networks to enable more direct internet access, we're seeing them adopt SD-WAN, or software-defined wide area network technology. But as you, you know, start to move towards this direct internet access, security has to be a, a major consideration. You can't just rely on, on your existing um, on-premises security stack. And you need to make sure that you're securing this, this branch edge and, and cloud edge that has, has really developed. And so over the next 30 minutes or so, these are the three main things that I, I want to explore with you. Um, so first, I want to share some of the, the trends and resulting challenges that we're seeing um, it, across the, the industry, um, and then talk about a new approach to how you can actually secure branch offices and roaming users and this new cloud edge. And then finally, I want to wrap up and just share some of the considerations that you should look at when you're looking for solutions in this area and some best practices that, um, that we've learned. Now first, um, I want to kind of share with you some of the, the trends that we're seeing and what we're hearing. I want to share with you some of the results of a research um, uh, report that was written by ESG, the Enterprise Security Group. Um, so we actually at Cisco sponsored this research where we, uh, ESG actually surveyed 450 respondents um, back in the fall. And this was a, a very diverse set of um, organizations that we were able to survey. So it was um, North America and Western European companies who had 50 million in revenue and above and more than 500 employees. And there was a, a good cross-section from you know, the, the small mid-sized organizations up through some of the, the very large enterprises. 
And it was, it, it asked the, these questions of uh, professionals who were either working in cybersecurity, IT, or networking. So it was a little bit of a, a cross-section of those. But the, the main, one of the main things that we were looking for was, did they have knowledge of, of branch office and, and uh, roaming user security? So digging into um, what the results were that we actually saw. So first of all, when you think about this explosion of, of cloud apps that we've seen happen, um, nearly one third of the respondents reported that the their, that SaaS applications now account for 50% or more of their business applications today. So you can see it's already started. You know, there's been a, a big shift from on-prem to cloud-based um, applications. And when when you look at when when we asked about how do you how do you see that changing over the next few years, it basically doubled. Where we saw 60% of respondents said that that they thought that SaaS apps would would account for more than 50% of their, um, their their business applications in the next few years. So we're seeing this trend continue. And when we think about the risks that come into play here. Um, so there, there's a few big things. So first of all, there's, there's the, the, the risk of shadow IT. Um, think about how many SaaS apps do you think are, are in use at your organization today? Two years ago, the average was about 1,200 different SaaS applications, and based on, or uh, app applications in, in general. Um, and based on our recent data, we're seeing that the average has doubled, and it's now three or 4,000. So th there's just massive growth in, in just the number of different SaaS apps that are, are being used. And when you think about it, you know, when you, uh, first of all, users can install and use apps on their own without vetting from IT, right, which wasn't, wasn't the case before, right? It, before, IT vetted everything and determined what was going to actually be used. But that's no longer the case. And so there's a much greater risk that employees can start using risky apps that are going to demand excessive access permission. We, we, there was a, a study done, uh, a different study done, that showed that 54% of apps actually demand permissions that exceed the, the permission level that's actually needed for the app to function. So think about an app that requires full access to your Google or, or Microsoft Office 365 account and has the ability to share information on your behalf, right? There, there's a huge potential um, for damage there. And you think about um, the, the third thing that you see there is, is it's easier to expose sensitive information because users can access, create, and share information with their coworkers, partners, customers, even the entire internet um, if, if you click the wrong, uh, the, uh, the wrong access permissions. And so there's a, a bigger risk of exposing sensitive information either inadvertently um, or maliciously at times. So along with the, the explosion of cloud apps, you think about also with uh, roaming users and how that shifted. And so as part of this survey with ESG, we defined roaming users as those who work from a home office, on the road, or um, any other non-corporate location at least 20% of the time. And what we found that was in North America, about 43% of employees were, would be considered roaming users. In Europe, it was a little bit less than that, about 36%, but it, it's looking to, to grow to about 50% in the next two years. Now, the other thing that's interesting, so you think you have all these roaming users who are out there. And so we, ask, we also asked the, the respondents if they mandated use of VPN. And now 82% of those organizations did have a mandate that their employees use VPNs when they're off the corporate network. But 8 out of 10 uh, believe that, that roaming users either frequently or sometimes avoid VPN use, which means that they're exposed. They don't have all of the, um, the, uh, the security that's really needed to protect them. And when you think about it, even when VPN usage is required for access to certain apps like email or salesforce.com, employees will often turn it off while they're doing other work or, or while they're browse, browsing to other sites. So that leaves them um, more vulnerable because they're not getting that, that protection that they do while on network from your, your traditional security staff. Now moving on to kind of the, the, some of the trends that we're seeing in branch offices. So with the survey, 
four out of five organizations uh, reported that they are shifting to direct Internet access. Um, either for some or all of their branch and remote offices. And 76% use SD-WAN either extensively or selectively. And I was a little bit surprised about this, this stat in particular. I was surprised that it was, it was as high as it was. Um, but I know, you know, even in, in some recent customer conversations, it seems like SD-WAN is, is really on the minds of, of a lot of organizations, um, just, you know, just, thinking about how their, their network is going to transform as, as a result of um, all these, these changes that we're seeing in, uh, in, in how we work. So it's definitely a, a, big, um, a big trend that we're seeing. Now, as part of this, um, when you think about, so looking at these trends, what does that then mean from a, a security perspective? And so we asked the question as part of the survey, you know, what are the biggest security challenges that you're facing in, in securing these remote offices and, and, and uh, roaming users. And these were the top three that came back. So first of all, it's just, it's just difficult to manage security when you think about all the different places that, that you need to uh, be concerned about. You have the branch offices, the cloud-based workloads, SaaS apps. It's just difficult to manage that security. The second one was just having a lack of visibility into the branch office and, and roaming user activity. So being able to, to monitor and make sure that you're enforcing, um, just having that, that lack of visibility there. And then the third one, um, which I think is also important as part of the SD WAN conversation, is that it requires strong collaboration between security and network operations teams, which is often challenging for a lot of organizations. So when you think about, you know, SD-WAN um, coming into play and needing to have security as part of that conversation, it's often a, a challenge for um, many organizations. Now, if we uh, look a little bit more about um, some of the, the branch office vulnerabilities, um, this one was, was interesting. So especially for, for people, um, for anybody who has any sort of merger and acquisition activity that happens, when you think about bringing on a, a new office, 42% of respondents said that branch office security deployments take over a month. So there's, there can be a, a long a time where you don't have the right level of, of protection for those users, and it can be costly to do. Um, and especially when you think a lot of times it's, it's because there's appliance-based security that has to be uh, shipped out and then set up and a lot of organizations also have limited staff in a lot of their branch offices. So it can also be challenging to um, be able to manage those, those sites over time. Then when you look at the one on the, the, the stat on the bottom, so 68% of recent attacks, what organizations found was that branch offices and roaming users were identified as the source of compromise in those attacks. And that's really because attackers know which users are, are most vulnerable, and they're going to try to find the path of least resistance when they're attempting to infiltrate an organization. And this, this just really shows that uh, they're, they're having success. They know who, who ends up being most vulnerable a lot of the times, and they are going after and, and targeting those organizations or, or those, uh, those user populations, I guess. All right. So when it, when it comes to actually um, securing um, the, the remote users and the remote offices, 76% of the respondents in the survey reported that they would prefer a multifunction security platform to solve this remote security challenge. So, you know, they're not necessarily looking for those individual point products in order to secure them. They ideally want to have a, a security platform that includes multiple functions to help them with that. And when you think about how you can actually um, achieve that, so there's options to deploy on-prem. And so this is also an area that, that Cisco's um, gotten into or, or, or focused on in, in the past as well, is that you can build more of this security functionality into on-prem appliances. But then you do have to manage them, right, versus having a single cloud offer that you can point and, and start to instantly deploy. And the, the good thing is that there used to be a trade-off. There used to be, you know, you, if you wanted 
um, security that was, you know, high efficacy. Uh, it, it had to be on-prem, but it was complex. And if you wanted something that was simpler, it, it, was, it might be in the cloud, but that tended to be sometimes lower efficacy. But that's no longer the case, which is a good thing. You can have both in the cloud, both the high efficacy and simplicity. You don't have to make that sort of trade-off. And so what we've been seeing happening is we've seen this, this shift to the cloud where you have a lot of this traditional on-prem security uh, functionality is now converging in the cloud for more effective protection. And, and all of these kind of what standalone on-premises solutions are coming together into what, what we're calling the, the secure internet gateway. And this, it, it becomes this consolidated cloud service that you're able to, to have. And so if we think about, well, what's actually in a, what is a secure internet gateway? What does it actually do? Um, I like to think of it as it's, it's this kind of secure on-ramp to the internet. So anytime uh, your users are connecting to the internet or to cloud applications, even when they're off the VPN, a secure internet gateway acts as a secure on-ramp and provides this level, uh, this, this deep level of inspection and, and protection for users. And so no matter where they're located or what they're trying to connect to, all the traffic goes through this, this cloud platform first, and there are different types of inspection and policy enforcement that can happen there. And you can have these mul multiple levels of and multiple types of security services that are integrated together in this one platform. And back in uh, 2017, we introduced Umbrella as the Cisco Umbrella as the industry's first secure internet gateway um, that was cloud delivered. And since then, we've been continuously uh, delivering more and more into this platform to make this vision a reality for our customers. Looking a little bit closer into, well, what, what sorts of security services are actually included there? So this, this kind of gives you a, um, a sense of, of what we're bringing together. So in the, the Cisco Umbrella platform, we're bringing together DNS layer security. So DNS layer security is, is all about providing that first line of defense against threats, because it's, it's first doing the inspection of the DNS request, right? So when you think about um, any time you click on a link or you type a URL, the first thing that happens is a DNS request is sent to identify what's the domain and IP address to, to make that connection. And so what we're actually doing here is we're able to block malicious or unwanted destinations. So if there's you know, concerns about inappropriate content being accessed, things like that, we're able to block that before a connection is ever established. And the great thing about enforcing security at the DNS layer is that we can do it without adding any additional latency, and we can stop threats across all ports and protocols before they ever reach your network or endpoints. And the same thing is even if you have um, infected devices that come onto your network and you know, a command and control callback tries to, to establish, we can block that as well and help you actually identify those infected devices. So it becomes this kind of very, very fast, easy first line of defense. And that's what Umbrella has traditionally been known for. Um, and so now we're taking the, the, the great platform that we had and adding even more. So we, we've also added a secure web gateway um, functionality. So if you want to have deeper inspection of web requests, then you can also proxy all of the traffic to Umbrella and gain full URL logging. You can do content filtering as well as malware inspection. And the great thing about this is, is you also get flexibility in terms of how you deploy this. So you don't necessarily have to proxy all of your traffic. You could decide for certain locations, maybe uh, you, you want to just do DNS layer security, but then for others, you want to be able to proxy everything. So we give you that flexibility to, to do that. And the other great thing too is, you know, there's, uh, there's obviously a lot, of, um, a lot of encrypted traffic now, uh, now going out there. So with Umbrella, we also have selective SSL decryption. So we can effectively block threats that might be hiding in encrypted traffic but we can also do it selectively. So it, you don't necessarily have to uh, decrypt 
you know, uh, financial sites, things like that. You can do it, uh, you know, get the level of protection without impacting privacy. Now, the next one that you see there is the cloud-delivered firewall right in the center. Um, and so this is, is giving you that protection across all ports and protocol. Um, so we have a layer three and layer four uh, firewall functions that can be applied for all outbound traffic. And so all activity is logged um, and any unwanted traffic is blocked using IP port and protocol rules. The next one um, is the, the CASI, the Cloud Access Security Broker functionality that we're adding. So this is where we're, we're integrating um, the CASB functionality from CloudLock, which Cisco acquired um, a couple of years ago. And we're integrating that into Umbrella so that you can, first of all, uncover all of the cloud apps that are in use across the organization, so identifying that shadow IT, and then giving you the ability to block or allow based on the category or app that's being used. Um, so this will be a, an area that we continue to, to build out and develop. And actually, in, in across all of these areas, we're continuously developing more and more functionality that will be rolling out over time. Um, but it, it, that's really the, uh, the, the main intent there is getting that control over the, the staff usage that's happening across the organization, and no matter where those users are. And then the last piece that you see there is the interactive threat intelligence. So obviously any, any security product is going to have threat intelligence as, as, a, as a critical part of that. And when we look at threat intelligence, so first of all, we take a more proactive approach by gathering data on the attacker's techniques and the infrastructure that they're using to help us detect and, and understand attacks. So what we're actually doing is we're taking all of the, I mean, first of all, actually, we are, we're getting intelligence from the Cisco Talos um, organization. So Cisco Talos is a, a group of about 200, uh, 300 researchers, um, and it's actually the largest non-governmental uh, threat intelligence team, um, and it, it feeds in intelligence across all of Cisco's security products. And one of the things that we do is we also take data from not only we, – we take DNS-level uh, data, we take web data, email, um, uh, file information from, from sandboxing. And we take all of that activity and all of that data, and we apply statistical and machine learning models against it. And we're actually able to uncover um, and basically map out the good and the bad across the Internet. And we're able to uncover and block malicious domains, IPs, URLs, and, and files, sometimes even before they're even used in attacks. And so not only will we tell you um, that something is bad, right? I, you see up there, it's what, what makes it interactive? So not only do we tell you that something is good and bad, but as part of Umbrella, we can also give you access to that threat intelligence either through a web console or an API. So you can actually use that and, and dig around and, and really understand, well, what, what is known to be bad about this a particular you know, domain or URL? What, what else is it associated with? And what else can you learn about the attackers? And you can use that to also feed it into your, uh, your security teams or your incident response teams to aid in investigation. So all of this is really the, the core functionality that um, comes into Cisco Umbrella. And having all of this functionality in a single platform is important because it helps to reduce the amount of time, money, and resources that you previously had to, to put out for, you know, deployments and, and configuration and ongoing management. So it's, it's all consolidated into one platform. Now, the other thing that's also important is um, the, the how do you get traffic to this cloud platform? Because you think about, you have, um, you know, SD-WAN, you have different networking devices, different networks, different, uh, you know, laptops and, and uh, roaming user devices. And so there's also a lot that we've done in terms of, you know, how do we make that integration simple between all those different devices to make it simple to connect and, and send traffic to our cloud platform. So now that you have a, a little bit more of a background on, on Umbrella and, and secure, you know, what exactly a secure Internet Gateway is and, and does, I want to talk a little bit about some of the important considerations that you should look at 
when you're um, thinking about a solution in this area. And there's four key ones that I want to um, touch on today. So reliability, efficacy, uh, coverage and integration. So, you know, what are you able to protect? How does it integrate with what you have? And then deployment and management. So let's start with the reliability. So with the reliability, um, you know, you think about the, the fact that you're sending all this traffic to a cloud platform. So performance is really going to be critical, right? It can't break or slow down your user's internet connection, right? And, and when you think about, most of the time when people think about security, they think about there is going to be a, a slowdown. But there doesn't have to be, and it doesn't have to be, you know, noticeable to anybody. So that's obviously an, an important piece is that speed and reliability. And when you think about um, a, a having a, a fast and reliable cloud infrastructure, you also want to think about um, the, the vendor's cloud DNA, right? You want to make sure that it's somebody who really understands cloud, um, has the, the DNA um, intrinsically in their, in their processes. Um, and so when, you, when you're looking at that, some of the questions that you might want to ask vendors um, and that you want to think about is, first of all, like understanding how is their cloud infrastructure actually architected? Because um, not, not all uh, cloud infrastructures are created equal. And so some of the things that you might want to think about, um, first of all, data center location. You want there, there to be data centers that are located around the world, especially in areas that you do business and have employees working. But an important piece of this is it's not just about the number of data centers, right? It, it's not just saying that, that there are hundreds of data centers. But what's really most important is how and where they're actually connected. So you want to think about, are they co-located, are they, you know, physically in the same location at the, the major internet exchange points? And the reason that that becomes important is because of the, the number of peering partners that they'll have. So you want to make sure that they're peering with hundreds of the, of the top ISPs and content delivery networks. And the reason for that is that you want to make sure that, that you know, they're able to exchange BGP route and ensure that they're routing requests most efficiently and not adding any latency over other providers. And so you want to look for, you know, you know hundreds and, and you, you want to think about how many peering partners they have and then how many active peering sessions they have as well. One of the other things is, is think about um, the use of any cast technology. Um, so this is something that, that Umbrella was really built on is, you know, having the use of, of Anycast and being able to ensure that users aren't just tied to a single data center, um, but they connect to, you know, for, for, from a DNS perspective, we connect users to our, um, a, a single IP. So when you set up Umbrella, you point them to an IP address, and then on the back end, we route them to the closest, fastest data center based on where they are and um, what's fastest at that point. So they're not tethered to a particular data center anytime that they're traveling, but they're always going to be connected to the fastest one. So you want to think about um, how that whole architecture is really um, architected and you know, how it's also kept up to date, things like that. So when you think about, you know, looking for what's the, the service level agreement, um, and then is there th any third party testing available or references that really talk about what the impact is to the, the end users, and they should be able to provide that. Now the next one um, is the efficacy. Um, so obviously, you want a highly effective security platform. That's, that's very important. Um, and there's a lot of talk in, in, the, in the industry right now around machine learning and artificial intelligence and analytics, but that is only as good as the data that you have. So you want to make sure that um, the, the sources of data, you want to have really, the, the vendor should have a, a big and diverse data set, you know, looking at email, DNS, web, files and sandboxing, all of that should really be the, the you know, you want to think about the, what is the diversity of the data and what are the sources of their threat intelligence. So are they, are they doing any of this um, threat intelligence 
on their own? Do they have the data? Do they have the security researchers? And what methods are they using? Right? So you want to make sure that they're not just using third party or static intelligence, but what are they also bringing to the table? What are they doing that's different? And look also at, you know, how, how are they, how is their intelligence seen across the industry? So are they doing, or do they have peer reviewed papers? Do they have researchers who are, you know, sharing their, their research, research more publicly and kind of looking at things in a more cutting edge way? So those are things that you'll want to, to think about from the, the, the back end of the, the, of the Intel side. And then I would also encourage you to think about how you'll test the efficacy and what the impact of that would mean for your security team. So first of all, when, if, if you're doing a proof of concept or, or proof of value, um, think about what the baseline is coming into that um, and, and what you typically see from, uh, you know, the, the, think about the number of, of machines that you're re-imaging. Think about, um, you know, how many alerts you're typically seeing in, um, in, in your other security systems. What are you seeing from your IDS, ITS? Um, your, your traditional firewall, your AV, um, and think about how much time your users are, are your uh, employees are spending, uh, you know, re-imaging machines, how many malware infections are you seeing, and looking at how does that change once you, um, once you deploy um, a secure internet gateway or, or, or it, really any security solution, but, you know, really think about how you're going to test that efficacy. Um, and if you're not able to, test it yourself, then, then think about, you know, how can the vendor also provide you with information about what they've seen in the past from organizations similar to your size and, and what is the impact on that team. Now, the next one um, I want to talk about is the, the coverage and the um, integration. So even though, um, you know, you, you might be looking at extending security to the cloud, you want to think about how it ties into your existing investments, whether it's investments that you've made on the network and how that's architected and the endpoint and other security. Um, and a big piece of this is also, you know, the, the APIs that are available um, and what kind of APIs are available for you to leverage, whether it's on the management side, uh, you know, actually setting things up and, and setting up the integration, reporting, um, et cetera. So think about how, how, how can that be leveraged to tie into what you already have. Um, and are you able to integrate intelligence from other systems too, right? If you've, if you've um, invested in other security solutions, can you integrate that? And, you know, maybe you have that on-prem appliance, but can you leverage any of that intelligence and extend it beyond, extend it to roaming users? And do they have the integrations available to help you do that and make use of what you already leverage? And then the final one, which is, which is kind of uh, related, um, especially on the integration side, think about you know, how the, the mechanisms that are available to get traffic to the cloud platform. Um, when you think about, you know, how, how can you actually uh, deploy globally? How quickly are, are organizations of your size able to deploy globally, and what does that actually look like? Um, and are there deployment options available? Is it kind of like there's only one way to do it? What, what are the ways that, uh, that the vendor enables you to do that? And is it the same for every single location, or do you have flexibility to deploy based on the location, based on the use case that you have. And then think about, too, you know, is there any hardware to deploy or are there any software components that you would have to manually upgrade? Um, so think about what, what is the, what's the ongoing maintenance going to be for, um, for the solution? Because there are definitely a lot of things um, and new innovations that are developed by vendors to aid in the, the deployment and the management. And this has been a big area that, um, Cisco has been investing time in, um, and one example of that is with IPsec tunnel creation. So people have been deploying IPsec tunnels for uh, quite some time now, and one of the things that we've done is actually looked at, well, how can we do that better and, and differently and make it easy for, um, easier for our users to, to do or our customers to do? And one of the things that we've actually done is we've, we've figured out that we can actually leverage any test technology for IPsec tunnels to help with kind of the redundancy and the failover. 
Because most of the time when you deploy an IPsec tunnel, you have to actually, um, you know, deploy a secondary tunnel for failover. But we've actually, with this technology, we've developed ways where you don't have to do that. The technology can actually do it for you. So if the tunnel goes down or if the data center goes down, it will automatically spin up and, and go to another data center um, to make it, you know, much easier for you from any, any downtime um, and just the, the regular ongoing maintenance that you typically face. So that's just an example, um, but, you know, this, this is something that I, I think is, is an important piece, especially when you think about what sort of resources do you have to manage a solution ongoing. And with that, I'm going to wrap up for now. Um, so just a couple of things to consider as, as next steps. So first of all, think about where your organization is today with the trends that we've talked about. And think about how your security staff is, um, is, is going to have to evolve and what options are out there for you. And when you are, if you are looking at SE-WAN, make sure that security is tied into that conversation from the beginning so that you, you don't have those, those gaps and, you know, trying to catch up, but be part of that conversation from the beginning. And if you do, you know, I, I would encourage you to look at, at Secure Internet Gateway Solutions and if uh, interested, you know, test out Cisco Umbrella and see how that might work for your organization. And so with that, I think we, we have time for a few questions. Um, so, Doug, I don't know if you're seeing anything come through. Yes, we certainly do have a, a few that have come through so far, and we'll get right to them. Okay, uh, the first question is, how exactly is Umbrella licensed? Sure. So that's a great question. So we do have several packages um, that are available, and for most of them, it is primarily based on the number of users, um, So it's, and it is a, a SaaS based uh, platform, so number of users per year um, pricing. But there are some other um, options that are available, um, for example, for guest networks. Um, there's some other uh, licensing options that, that are available. All right, our next question. What network devices do you integrate with? Sure. So there are, there are a wide range of uh, network devices that, that we're able to integrate with. Um, and you can check out our, our, uh, our docs page. So if you go to umbrella.cisco.com, um, or actually docs.umbrella.com, I believe, we can make sure that that's correct. Um, and, and that's where you can see some of the um, out-of-the-box integrations that we have. There are, if, if you have uh, Cisco gear, in your environment, then I, we, we do have a, a quite a bit of, of support across ISRs, um, SD WAN, the, uh, the, the the wireless Meraki devices. So there's a wide range that we're able to support. And just to confirm, it is docs.umbrella.com uh, where you can check out the the uh, the documentation for more details. Okay. Uh, next question. How quickly do you actually see large org organizations deploy? Yes. And that is, I mean, and it is, it is funny because, we, you know, you, you often, see, you, you see people, uh, and I'm, I'm on the marketing side, so obviously I, I see this quite a bit, but you, you do see people making claims, and, and, you know, we've made them before too, is that you can literally get started and get protection in minutes. And the exciting thing from, from my perspective is, is I'm not just saying that. I, we actually have a lot of customers, even the, some of the largest organizations, who have been able to deploy very quickly, um, and especially on the DNS side. That, and that's really where we encourage most customers to start, is to get that, that initial level of protection, point your DNS to us, and we'll, you'll, you'll be amazed at what we're able to start protecting very quickly. We had a, um, a large um, coffee, coffee house um, globally recognized, they were able to actually deploy to thousands of uh, sites in about two hours. And that was to protect their guest network. But, you know, you really can do it quite quickly, get that initial level of protection on the DNS side, and then start to uh, deploy additional protection. So if you want to leverage more of the secure web gateway capabilities or the cloud-delivered firewall, you can then roll out from there, but at least you get that initial protection. And if you, um, you want to also see some of the, the customer 
feedback yourself, um, we do have that on, on um, umbrella.cisco.com. You can see uh, some of the case studies where a lot of them are mentioned. But then if you also look at Gartner Peer Insights, um, that's kind of like the Yelp of, of IT. Um, you can look at Cisco Umbrella there. So Gartner Peer Insights, look at Cisco Umbrella, and you can see also some of the, the customer feedback around that. Okay. Large international coffee shop. That doesn't give it away at all. <laughs> no, there's lots of those. <laughs> okay. Well, I am glad we were able to answer a few of the questions that uh, came in today, but we are sort of out of time and are going to have to wrap things up. Our thanks to Meg for the presentation and to Cisco for sponsoring the program. And, of course, thanks to all of you for joining us today. This webcast will be available shortly at www dot scmagazine.com and that can be found under the events tab on the homepage. Thank you all again and have a great day.